And we're live. All we're right. recording. We're it's going. working. Many settings have to be perished in order to make this podcast happen. But we're here now. It's all good. It's all golden. We are recording again. Yes. Um... Yeah, so we've we've decided to go with the Guillotine Assurance Society for the moment. This is the Guillotine Assurance Society. It is. Buy your guillotine insurance today. Because. And uh, fuck the rich. If you're triggered by the word socialist, now might be a time to go and make a nice soothing cup of tea and put on your blindfold. And just not watch any television or radio or read any newspapers and seal yourself off in a little bubble and everything will be okay. Just, you know, just, yeah. Anybody still here? That's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we thought we'd, you know, because uh, both Graffin and I have, have oh, Rembimon now. Just Remby. Years, years of calling him Graffin, that's Remby. Uh, and I, your your co-host V, um, wanted to start recording a, a sort of semi-regular podcast, maybe one a month. Yeah. Depending on demand. Depending on, yeah, it could be. Demand, you know. Maybe. As many as... 200 people might want to listen to it. <laughs> as many as two centuries. Yes. 200 people. But yeah. But it's nice to have an avieur. Because then you can... then Well, because I, I meet loads of weird people. Mm. That, you know, want to go... So what, what is it you do? And then I say washing up. And then people walk away. Until I say, and make films and podcasts and all kinds of creative shit. And they'll yeah. come back and ask me what it's about. And it's nice to have some things to point at. A sort of broad perspective. And Remby and I have been, you know, if, if if this is the first you're you're hearing of us, Remby and I have probably been making videos and podcasts and shit for somewhere between fifteen and twenty years. It's easily fifteen. Easily fifteen years, yeah. When did we two first meet? Mm. So post two thousand, possibly as late, uh, possibly as late as two thousand and five, but sometime in between that. I think it was 2005, because early 2000s I was still living in Sheffield. And oddly enough, we were both semi, in the office we were working, semi-legendary figures. It was 2000, the... it, I think it was 2005, mm. right? Because I started working at that office in 2004. Yeah, and you were working on the home office side. HMRC. Yeah. The start. But you were working day shifts and then I met you. But I'd heard about you because of your unusual fa- Halloween fancy dress decision we'll leave it there for the moment yeah. and you'd heard of me because i'm possibly the only person that's ever worked in an it help desk with a kill yes <laughs> <laughs> there is a person dead because i fixed their printer listen back to uh, rangers radio uh, yeah or, that story. Or, or leave a comment about how you want to hear about that we might talk about it sometime. it might be relevant yeah. um so yeah so uh, and then we sort of hung out got similar interests we're both nerdy both into uh, equality of opportunity and yeah we just hung out and then we started doing Rangers Radio which evolved into all sorts of things Rangers TV then Rangers Tube yeah and Urban Agoge and the offshoot being Church of Server and all sorts of things and now there's a Rangers Discord and if you want to search for it online it's R4NGER5 tap that in anywhere on the internet and your preferred browser and you'll bring up some of our work which will link into all the rest so yep. do not be alarmed so yeah so that's it so today's subject because it's not because it's in the news but because we it's one of the, probably the more historical events that the UK faces this is the the, uh, the democratically historic event yes politically yeah. historic so which is Brexit which is possibly yeah. one of the stupidest ideas ever tabled mm-hmm all to shut up Nigel Farage. It would have been cheaper and more convenient just to sort out like a wet work detail, wouldn't it? Well, <laughs> it would cost us about 50 quid to get someone angry enough to pop over there and, you know, top him while he was an MEP. Well, you know, there's also that whole thing that I linked to earlier about um, the... It's always people we like that get killed in mysterious yeah. circumstances. Yeah. Never anybody, you know... There's also the whole thing of the um, legislation that the European Union is bringing in in 2020. Which is? Um, closing loopholes for um, tax avoidance. Yeah, that's probably the biggest reason yeah. that Brexit has come about. Because if Britain's not in the in the EU, that will all done They can apply. leave all the loopholes open and maybe yeah. even make some bigger ones. So we'll be an offshore banking trust. Mm-hmm. We'll be... Uh, it's like being Airstrip 1, but financially. I don't know what that is. Dollar Strip 1. <laughs> yeah, because it won't exactly be Pound Strip 1 anymore. Yeah. 
It might as well be dollars. Yeah, considering fucking... Ooh, can you imagine? 15 years in the future, the dollar. The it's dollar pound. The, the dollar pound. It'd be a dollar pound <laughs> to, to, like, you know... It'd be a dollar pound because it'll be like, oh, it's at least it's partly British. No, it'd be all dollar. It'd be all American. Yes, state 51. So... Neither of us think Brexit is a good idea. Yeah, so, you know, so in a, whilst when, we're, until we, we get turned into Airstrip 1, it's, uh, yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah, so it, it started in 2016 with a national referendum, during which a bunch of stupid people decided that we wanted to leave the EU because they'd been lied to. They'd been lied to systematically for they decades. saying it was costing us £350 million pounds a week Yep. to be in the EU, which it doesn't. Nope. Because we get a gigantic rebates, about half that in actual fact. Yep. And that money goes towards, and we even get some of that 170 million back in investment from the EU for infrastructure and um, cultural investments. Yeah. The sad thing, one of the sad things is, is that some of the places that voted the most to leave the EU are the are, most depressed. Are the most depressed places. The ones that were being helped out by Europe the most. Yes, and the places being helped out by Europe, Europe grants the most. That's the, the one of the sad things about it. Yeah. Um, every politician who has been for Brexit has lied, categorically has lied, to further that goal. Mm. We've got evidence of them actually lying about it. I mean, there's even um, evidence that, uh, just like the American general election, Brexit was uh, diddled about with by Cambridge Analytica. If not directly diddling in the votes, then by um, cyber warfare. Yeah, just like influencing Facebook social engineering posts and all that sort of thing. Fake Facebook accounts and stuff like that. Yeah. Fake Twitter accounts and all kinds of crazy shit. And then, you know, just the last... 50 years almost, you know, some newspapers have been arguing against the EU, bringing out all sorts of stupid fake regulations like the length of an acceptable banana. Which is bullshit. Crazy shit about, what, you know, what you can and can't call a Cornish pasty and Parmesan cheese. And... Which we lobbied for. Yeah. We lobbied for the protection of Cornish pasties. Because it's a, it's a protected thing. If it doesn't come from Cornwall, it's not a Cornish pasty. We lobbied for that. Yeah. So we can't blame the European Union for that. And champagne, which is, you know, could only be produced in the champagne region of France. It's like, yeah, okay. But not all champagne wine is sparkling and tastes of three day old piss. But, uh, it, yeah. it's those are like the small things that don't matter. But, you know, in a, in a way, if you, if you do produce that particular cheese or that particular wine, it is important that the brand name does not get diluted. You can't buy champagne yep. that's been bottled in slough, no. for instance. And you shouldn't. You know, Cornish pasties I'm less fussed about. It's like saying Yorkshire puddings. I mean, we're in Lancashire right now, and I'm more than a dab hand at making a Yorkshire pudding. It's an old enough thing. A Cornish yep. pasty, it's meat, potatoes, and other stuff, and swede in a folded pastry case. But, I don't really think it needs protection. But we're getting sidetracked. Those are just minor things. It's a bit like uh, Christmas being changed to Winterval, yeah. which it never has, yet the Daily Mail has repeated that non-news uh, lie for the yeah. last 30 or 40 years. It's somewhere in its publication at least once every five years. Yeah. So, you know, there was all this sort of bollock stuff. And outside of basically good stuff, where we in the UK have benefited from employment laws, minimum holiday amounts, min maximum working hours in any one given time period. For instance, you you must have at least 11 hours between each shift. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to finish at, say, 6 o'clock in the evening, there's, you can't start earlier than 5 a.m. the next day Yeah. to basically stop you from going mad with sleep deprivation and stuff like that. I've never seen anything negative come out of Europe. It's always been a positive thing. I can't. There's no. There's the no. only thing that's negative are European banking reg regulations, which keep major banks in check, which somewhat limited the financial crash's real impact on governments and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, the European Union, through its foresight, has generally saved our bacon yeah. in the last 50 years. And there hasn't been a land war in Europe in it's the last 50 years. It's been a force for peace. It so has. Yeah. If you look at, look at the history of Europe prior to the European Union... There was never a point in Europe's history where there wasn't a war going on at some point. Yeah. 
you look at any part of it, this is the longest amount of time that Europe hasn't been at war mm. in history. Mm. It's incredible. Yet we get people with interests, monetary interests, mm. who only care about lining their own pockets, like Farage. Well, lying. Farage's sponsors, Farage's employers. It's yeah. like Trump's employers, like, you know, Boris Johnson's employers. Yeah. Aaron Banks, employers, for example. I, given that they're public figures, are, it's not the people. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, massively wealthy people who have a lot to gain by basically a world, a financial wild west. Yeah. Where they can short entire economies and bail out while they've made money because they'll, they'll, the banking regulations prevent insider trading at the moment. Well, what if there was, you know, instead of being like a Cayman Islands account, it will be a UK account. Mm hmm. Which is what they, which will be our only industry. Really. Probably gonna be, yeah. It's the only part of the, like, it's the only thing that like, the UK has that's strong right now. Yeah. The you UK's, know. the UK's um, employment industry, the whole of the UK, all the employment industries of the UK. It's nearly all service industry. It's nearly all service industry. Yeah. We used to be a heavy manufacturing country, and. The reason we're not a heavy manufacturing country anymore is nothing to do with markets because we were always making money. Mm. It's all to do with capitalism trying to eke out the most money possible. Mm. And where you can make the most money is illegally fleecing whole markets for different products. Yep. And they've been getting away with it for best part of a century, I'd say, easily. But Sheffield Steel is still considered like some of the best steel in the in the world. Mm. You know, to the point where we still have not a massive steel industry, but there is still a steel industry in Sheffield, which they've tried to shut down. The companies have tried to shut down, and every time they've tried it, there's been backlash mm. because steel was the backbone mm. of Sheffield. Well, it was the backbone of the Industrial Revolution. Mm-hmm. We could ship steel, we could ship shape steel to anywhere in the world that didn't have the resources to do it. And now the driver of the, the post industrial revolution is probably somewhere like China. Yeah. But that's not a bad thing in the 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 innovation is we're still pretty good at innovating in this country. Was you know, and in, in the West generally. Yeah. The West is generally a culture of innovation. Something doesn't work, change it. Whereas in more in the East it's a mind it's a bit, the mindset is more it's always been like this. That's changing. Mm-hmm. But we're shifting into with technologies, you know, more like um, I think we we might well shift back to more a cottage industry yeah. system where things are made in very small batches locally and then sold locally. Best best idea, really. It's the best idea um, environmentally. Yeah, I mean, less fuel used to produce stuff. I mean, you know, if we can, I mean. When you think about something like three three D printing, the PLA plastic can be made anywhere. There's something, Corn starch. There's something to be said, right, for well, this is why I'm like a big proponent of state ownership of Yeah, I think anything of, that your country absolutely has to have in order to function should be state owned. Yeah. Anything that's a, a luxury good or something that we don't actually need. There's like I think a lot of food production should be nationalised. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe then sold on to supermarkets, but the people know how much the supermarkets paid and how much the supermarkets need to add on in order to ship it to you in a convenient way. Yeah. So show me what percentage of your outlay is packaging and transport and staffing at your local store. And then sh- then we'll be able, you know, the government will publish how much they charge, say, Tesco's or Sainsbury's for a pound of potatoes. And then when you buy your pound of potatoes, if it's more than double what the state got, you know, we need food security, we need energy security, transport and infrastructure security in this country. Yep. And when you leave it in the hands of companies, it's not secure. No, it's anyway. not. Never. So, that, so that's where we're coming from in, in when we're talking about Brexit, which is only going to hurt. And I think that most politicians would rather Article 50 get revoked anyway. Yeah. If they're honest. If you could, if you could corner them and, say, and well, say, given the choice, if you can wave a wand, would you cancel Article 50? I think most of them would on the proviso that this whole debacle be used for something useful and Europe is somehow streamlined mm-hmm. because it is kind of a money pit yeah but it was always going to be a money pit i mean you've got to have a, an army of civil servants in brussels sorting all that out 
you know, even just to translate basic ideas to all the different languages in Europe, even to, you know, just iron out details and negotiate and stuff like that. And they're, largely it's been well negotiated. We haven't really lost as a result of being in Europe. I think we've gained hugely. We have gained hugely. And all, all this... You know, how much does a war cost? Yeah. In some cases, almost everything. You yeah. know, after the Second World War, this country was in penury. Mm -hmm. After the First World War, same thing. It took us 30 years to come. We had just enough time to recover from the First World War and had a lovely time in the 1930s before we were embroiled in yet another World War, mm -hmm. which put us back into penury for another decade. Yeah. Maybe and, even a decade and a half. And spent, and repaying Lee Slend for like which is, we've only 70 just years. It was like was while we were recording Rangers Radio that Lee Slend came up and the Americans had to hand back their air bases and yeah, stuff and like got, that. Yeah, and it finally got finished getting paid off. So it took us half a century to pay for the Second World War. Yeah. Which was ironic because we didn't charge them for fighting in Burma or Japan or no. Asia or anything like that. Well, it was it was them selling weapons and stuff to us. Yes, but on on such long terms, they must have made an absolute bomb. Maybe that can be a discussion for a, an Another episode day. two. Yeah, maybe we can talk the about real the cost of lend lease. How much did it yeah, cost yeah. us for those destroyers and cargo ships and and all tanks the things we needed? And tanks, food. really expensive machine guns as well. So yeah, it's like well, most people like just very quickly. Most people assume that like Britain had stens as mm. submachine guns, but not at the start. We had a lot of Thompsons. A lot of Thompsons, and they were expensive. They were £200. If you want to see it in action, no the one place you can sort of see it in action is Dad's Army. Yeah. Because their squad support weapon is a Thompson. They've got uh, Lewis as well. Yeah, so they're like pretty crappy stuff. But it was Home Guard. That was what we had left after we lost everybody at, uh, at uh, Dunkirk. Yeah, Dunkirk, yeah. Had to blow up all the tanks and trucks. and. That's why we ended up with the Home Guard. Carriers. What? That's why we ended up with the Home Guard. Yeah. But yeah, Brexit. We're getting sidetracked. Brexit. So, so Boris Johnson's on track to become the shortest-serving prime minister of all time. No, uh, and it's going to be a tough. It's going to be a um, a, to a tough fight between him and Theresa May as the most lame duck prime minister of his of British history. Yeah, it's making David Cameron and Tony Blair look good. Yep. <coughs> So yeah, it's really weird. It's this uh, this whole mad thing that's going on. Oh, so strange. Really you know, I think I, I still think most politicians would rather completely revoke Article Fifty altogether, but they're frightened of that segment of the British populace that is now doubling down on a bad decision. Yeah, it's like getting a shit car repaired for many thousands of pounds, so that the repairs are, are like five times the the, va the retail value of the actual vehicle. Yeah. I think the thing that I'm like most upset about with Brexit, aside from all the politicians lying, right, is the amount of people who voted for Brexit and still want Brexit, especially those who want a hard Brexit, who are also working class. Yeah, it's really and weird. Have clearly had their brains washed because. They were not like this in the eighties, in the seventies and eighties. We went to the People's History Museum today. Yeah, and the uh, people. If you're ever in Manchester, it's well worth a visit. I would, yeah, definitely recommend it. Free entry, but they do advise a five pound donation to keep them going. But it's free entry, and we saw all of the things that like has happened in Britain to fight for workers' rights. Yeah, for the best part of four hundred years, and for universal suffrage. Mm. For you say, like you say, the best part of four hundred years, and since the in post Second World War Britain, the um, socialist policy policies were popular. Oh Pe yeah, nineteen forty eight. The NHS appears. The NHS appeared. Yeah, the NHS. What? A, what? A, and it was. Harold Macmillan, maybe? I think so. Not without looking it up. But they, it, it was put in, and people were saying, this is fantastic. And in fact, it, we saw a thing there that where someone was saying, our, our, uh, the NHS is the envy of the world over. I think potentially the first country... I think one of the quotes is, we now 
morally lead the world. I think that was it, yeah. And if you've got socialised healthcare, that's true. I yeah. think the Soviet Union has automatically socialised healthcare. Yeah, I, will, I wouldn't be surprised. And Cuba. Mm-hmm. And Cuba, yes, Cuba does have socialised healthcare. But that was after the NHS. I think every country that's ever looked at it and was in a position to make it happen has gone, that's has a great gone, idea. That's a fantastic idea. Yeah. Except maybe America. I think they've got, they've got socialised healthcare in Canada. Canada has all over concern. all over the Commonwealth. Yeah, there is a version of the NHS. Mm-hmm. So we have the NHS, the British Commonwealth, the yeah. on, the only ex empire that has a list of people waiting to join. Yeah, ever yeah. in history. Yeah. So we have the NHS, and then we start nationalising a load of industries. Yeah, we nationalised the Coal railways. Coal gets nationalised. The railways get nationalised. Steel was nationalised. Steel was nationalised. Um, gas and electricity were nationalised mm. all of the in main infrastructures were nationalised the, the dockyards are nationalised dockyards were nationalised they're still nationalised yeah. actually uh, they're, they're privately owned anyway I don't know I, yeah. I would say I don't know but it would be nice if they were and they were nationalised for two decades two three decades until the Tory party of the late 70s, early 80s mm. and Margaret Thatcher and her ideas of neoliberalism well not entirely her ideas she was, it was her ideas based off of other yeah, it's kind of like a, a neoconservative playbook yeah. of nationalise everything and then that allows all the wealthy people to buy giant chunks of shares in them so she systematically started selling off the uh, industries. This came to a head in what 1982. That there'd been many strikes, many strikes leading up to this. Yeah, I mean, I was alive during but, the 1979's winter of discontent when ev- nearly most of the major industries that affected individual homes went on strike. The gas, the gas board went on strike. The trains were on strike. The rubbish collection, the rubbish collectors were on strike. The grave diggers were on some mm-hmm. on strike. That was pretty surreal. And I remember the electri- electricity net going off. I mean, fortunately, they never took off electricity and gas. Mm-hmm. But I remember several nights where we was where we sat in the kitchen because it was gas central heating that required a an electric pump. Yeah, it meant that the heating in our mace, in our flat, our council flat, yeah, was um, switched off. So we had to sit in the kitchen leaving the gas burners on the stove on to stay warm yeah. because it was the winter and it was a cold winter. There are photographs of 1979 and there's in in, centr- in fairly central London uh, at least a foot of snow on the ground. Mm-hmm. And that's when the gas board and the electricity board decided to go on strike. Yep. So they, they made themselves fabulously unpopular with the working class, did the unions, because the privation didn't really affect middle class and upper middle class people nearly as much as it affected people that ran a real risk of so, freezing to death. I think that that was down to a lack of, uh, or a, a failing in communicating the reasons why they were going on strike to, to working class I, people. I would like to interject that what they were going for in an era when inflation was about 1.5%, they were campaigning for pay rises that were kind of crazy, like 20%. Like an instant twenty percent pay rise, as a non-negotiable pay rise. That was um, coal, and because coal did it, electricity generation, gas, a lot of those workers. Maybe they were being massively underpaid, but from what I recall, not so much, because there were there were indeed successive strikes. Once one strike worked, the next year they would be out on strike to try and see if they could force the hand. So the people that were working weren't in penury because I remember everybody even in living in council houses seemed pretty affluent to me at the time but I was eight so so I'm going to say that may be the case but that doesn't justify what happened next no the complete destruction of the coal steel industry industry and the systematic oppression of strikers by the police and yeah. we, we have because it's now unsealed, no longer classified information. We now have documented uh, evidence that Margaret Thatcher 
wrote to the police chief specifically and said, break these strikes by force. Mm. And, you know, things like the Battle of Orgreave and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, literally lines of police horses baton charging people that were on strike that were trying to prevent unauthor- un- non-union workers from getting into coal mines and stuff. Mm-hmm. Because they were shutting down coal, coal mines left and right, and the ones that they were going to leave open went on strike in support of those can- closed coal mines. Yep. And in some areas, especially where we are now in Lancashire and Yorkshire, that was just ripping the heart out of loads of communities without providing anything anywhere. No, for we're those doing nothing to, to help them because the, 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 what you have to understand about Lancashire and Yorkshire is that if you were in a town in Lancashire and Yorkshire, it's almost guaranteed that it was to do with, that it was a mining town, mm. like almost all of them. The the cities were trading hubs, mm. but the towns, the towns were almost exclusively mining towns. And if if you ever happen to find yourself up in the north and you see um, uh, working men's clubs or miners' um, social clubs, they're all over the place and they're still there. Mm-hmm. You know, despite the fact there hasn't been a coal mine for like thirty years. Yep. And if you, you might see, if you're up here, um, pit head wheels, mm. um, just Loads of them. Sent half cemented into the ground. That's a reminder that yeah. there used to be the used to be the used to be the coal mining industry, and that was it. That was the entire industry of that town was coal mining, mm. or whatever mining it was. You know, it, it's the, their tin mining. I don't know if they were still doing tin mining down in Cornwall at the time, mm. but up here it was all coal mining, mm. and like. My granddad and my dad did coal mining for a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's a crappy job. It's a crappy job, but... It was reasonably well paid. Reasonably well paid, and it's not like they weren't... Um, I think people working in coal mines, by the time the 80s rolled around, they were getting something in the region of 30 grand a year. Mm-hmm. And even though, even though it was a dangerous job, it wasn't like it was... Um, it's not like it was made dangerous by lack of care. Because, well, because of previous trade unions making sure that certain health and safety stuff at work was obeyed in coal mines. Yeah, and that's why you ended up with like the um, the safety lamps, hmm. the miners' safety lamps that were designed by Sir Humphrey Davy in I think about eighteen forty thereabouts, yeah. eighteen twenty to eighteen forty, and also Stevenson's um, engine, steam engine. Yeah, and that helped. You know, all sorts of stuff. Basically, the coal mining industry kick-started the Industrial Revolution out of necessity to allow us to mine deeper. Mm-hmm. So, simply by creating a steam pump that could get water out of lower levels of mines that worked and wasn't nightmarish. It was, it was like steam engines were used, but then by venting the steam and using the piston, it cooled down the water, in which had to then be re- reboiled. They invented a jacket which used that heat mm-hmm. to heat a second layer of water to to run the downstroke yeah. of the pump. So they basically built one steam engine around another one. And then you get the actual steam engine leading to traction engines, steam locomotives, the works. You start getting, the railways. Yeah. International trade because railways are making shifting of heavy goods really easy from ports. You start getting canals. You start getting mechanization in the workplace yep. which which um only serve to help. And once you've got that kind of pumping equipment and remote drilling equipment then people found uses for oil mm-hmm. which leads to the transport revolution cars trucks the works yeah mind you even during the second world war they were using coal powered trucks yeah yeah no they were because we had coal in this country this was before we had north sea oil so the uk well britain didn't have oil no as a, na- as a national resource so we during the second world war we were using coal tr- coal powered trucks we were using coal powered trucks and we were using gas powered trucks that were wood gas burning gas. There were buses in London using wood gasifiers. They were using wood gasifiers, but there were also some burning um, coal gas yeah. as well. Because they found a way of extracting the gases from coal. Mm. And wood gas. And wood gas. Which is pretty amazing. So, yeah. So, you know, so with the destruction of the trade unions, we've become a service economy. And as we're a service economy, principally with financial stuff. They, they they viewed our economy with envious eyes and slowly and surely they drew their plans against us. We we don't have essentially um we're in no position to do anything except be subservient to other countries. Yeah. No we we could we could rebuild an economy but we would need to streamline the government so so much and allow yeah. for people to be entrepreneurs. I mean, 
we have got the internet. You know, one of one of our guys invented the World Wide Web. Yep. You know, we have got, you know, you could argue that the, you know, the UK invented the telephone. Mm. You know, so we have got this ability to do things on the internet, but they're very specialised and they're where possibly a, a another generation away from if this does cock everything up being a world leader in telecoms mm -hmm. but how much do you think the americans or the chinese will be able to lean on us for creating telecoms that allow for even easier mass surveillance yeah quite easily so yeah so we're going to be at the beck and call of larger powers because we're not part of the larger power of europe yeah you can't negotiate from outside all that easily it's been um <laughs> Europe doesn't need anything that we export. So it likes some of the things we export, but it doesn't need them. Mike Pence said, I think yesterday or earlier today, the UK is finished. It's now time for America. And I think that says everything. Didn't they ca didn't he cancel a talk the other day with Boris Johnson? He was there for a I think maybe and Boris Johnson made a stupid comment yeah. about you can't have the NHS, that's ours. And also, we've already got enough chlorinated chicken in the Houses of Parliament. And Pence was just like, clearly, there's no space for negotiation, and went home. Yeah. So Boris burned out the one thing that he could have said that he was actually doing. Mm -hmm. it's like, but he used to be Foreign Office Minister, and they just kept him out of everybody's way for a, for a couple of years. He got sidelined hugely in the Foreign Office. Because they needed, Theresa May needed to put him somewhere where he, was, he couldn't do any damage. Yeah. He was still able to do loads of damage. He's one of those. He's like a petulant child. Yeah. With nuclear weapons. It's, now, yeah. It's like we're American. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> the continuing on from the minor strikes in eighty two. In eighty two, wasn't it? Yeah. In eighty two, um, when they got broken up, there was a lot of um, anger and. Arguably, it's still there. Arguably, just, there yeah, is a, still a sense still of um, economic depression if you live in the north of England. Mm -hmm. Depression is what I was looking for. Mm. The word. Um, and what has happened since then, and I've seen this with my own eyes, newspapers, mostly newspapers, mm. have been slowly telling people, the working class people, that... The problems were never the government's problem, were never caused by the government, but were always caused by outside forces. Oh, that's that's borderline fascism. That's um, dialectics, isn't it? That's that. That's all from um, the Hegelian society. Mm. Outside forces. Um, they they used to claim that water boiled because outside forces came in and agitated the water. Yeah, it's it's what they've been doing for the last. Um, like 40 or 50 odd years mm. they've been well not 50 odd years Agit prop essentially isn't it they've been yeah they've been slowly telling people telling the working class that the problems are due to other people not not due to the government not due to rich people due to other people yeah and the, the sad thing is is that if you look at the working class prior to the strikes being broken they were so incredibly socialist the the amount of well, we still had things like the greater london council which was a, a shining beacon of socialism yeah there and was the all the all i've seen minor banners I've seen banners from minor galas that have got marx and lenin on them yeah and Tol and trotsky and it's just that should show you how strong socialism was in the UK prior to the um, the mines the mines being forcibly shut down and the strikes being broken. Mm. And I think there was sort of like a a an air an air of this didn't work, sort of like let's just say depression, mm. which led them to be unfortunately easy targets. No, yeah, I mean, but that, I mean, that's been, you know, there, there's the middle class will agree with socialism up to a point. Yeah. The working class uh, would hope for hope socialism if they understood what it was. 
and the upper class want to maintain the status quo. Yeah. Because sooner or later, if you go down the socialist thought route of saying, I do labour, am I compensated fairly for my labour? Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, no. Yeah. Because of a drive to create profit. Um, now, you can offset that and you can delay that in the way that Germany, Germany is a capitalist country. Yeah. Broadly speaking, you have to buy a house. Not everything is laid on by the state, but they have broadly socialist governmental values. Mm -hmm. So the government acts as a buffer between greedy corporations and exploitation of the workers. Yeah. They, you know, the German government kind of works, you know, um, to as a protectionist organization to protect the people of Germany, which is their job. Mm -hmm. and arguably the job of any parliament whereas we're now in a situation where it's the middle and upper middle classes that are being protected yeah i mean i love the guardian as a newspaper and we we were we were looking at things of the, the guardian was started the day after the peterloo massacre in manchester yeah it's a manchester newspaper and yes it's very lefty but it is kind of middle class lefty it's very middle class lefty, this is yes. the, you know whatever newspaper you read there's still a certain amount of decoding you need to do yeah and they, they did a big thing a while back. They've stopped now, thankfully. Um, there was a, an acronym, JAM, just about managing, where they were talking about middle-class people that were finding it hard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't really have a gigantic amount of sympathy. No. You know, I, I rate middle classes. I think once you start earning more than about thirty five, forty thousand pounds a year, you, you, you move into a middle-class bracket. You are, yeah, at that point. Um, your concerns are whether there is a lovely school nearby for your precious child yeah uh, and you want everything to continue on as normal you know being middle class makes you kind of conservative because you've got something to conserve yeah and the Guardian occasionally drifts towards a small c conservatism oh this time last year my money would have bought a much nicer house yeah whereas you know take a walk around the actual streets of any large city and see some poor sod that's homeless and dying of drug abuse and weather exposure mm -hmm. and you're like your problems are not my problem pale in comparison yeah. to that so you know i think you need to prov you know i think it's the government's job to provide a minimum of survival for everybody yeah you know i think there should be you know equivalent to service units that you can live in if you are totally destitute to give you an address so you can claim benefits. Let's never forget. Which we don't have. Yeah. Let's never forget that this country did have poor laws. Where if you were poor, you could get put in prison. Yeah, I mean, you can't be put in prison for vagrancy in this country. No, not anymore. No, that's... Uh, when, when did those... I'd have to look it up. But Probably it was about in the 1900s. 19th century, yeah. Yeah. We did have poor laws in this country. And if you if you... If you didn't have a job, you didn't have money, you had two options. You could go to a workhouse or you could go in prison. Hmm. We, saw some, we saw some posters related to that. Yeah. There. yeah, it's a good museum. It does make you come out, come, come out wanting to smash the system. Yes. I did warn you. <laughs> go for a cup of tea afterwards. Calm down. This has been going on for a very long time. I mean, Thomas Paine was a great idealist. Um, there's a very good Mark Steele lecture on Thomas Paine I recommend everybody if you haven't seen it go see it mm -hmm. and he managed to assist both the French and the American Revolution yeah and got booted out of both countries <laughs> for being too radical yeah um, and you got people like George Orwell in the, the early part of last century who fought in Spain on the international gr brigades on the socialist side he fought, fought with the um... POUM P-O-U-M yeah in Caledonia mm, Catalonia Catalonia, sorry, Catalonia, Catalonia. Scotland. A right, thought, sorry. a thought against fascism in Caledonia. In Catalonia, in, in Catalonia, yeah. where he saw and wrote about the anarcho-syndicalist communes there. Yeah, he wasn't amazingly flattering about it all. He did. He was like, okay, so I've just taken a look at the fascist pig that's in the trench a hundred yards away, and he looks just like me. Yeah. You know, um, the anarcho-syndicalists were very exclusionary, and he was like, well, we're never going to win. Because even on the socialist side, there were factions that were fighting against each other and stuff like crazy shit. So, yeah. So, you know, socialism is not the state will take everything you own. Socialism is about there being a bare minimum that everybody can expect to receive from the state. 
And if, if, if that makes your hackles rise, if you're thinking, but my taxes are going to poor people, you can choose. You can have your taxes go to poor people who will eventually then dig themselves up out of needing it because they get education, shelter, food, water, you know, just enough money to live on so they can better themselves and get a job. Or you can not pay that and then pay increasing taxes for police, crime prevention, hospitals. Here's when those people inevitably get so ill that they need a hospital yeah. stay. So here's the thing. No taxes, right? So first time you have to call the police. There's your bill. $2,000 for a call out. Yeah. Oh, um, you shoot someone on your own property. In America, oh, just pick in America. Yeah, right? then you have to pay for the coroner's inquest. You have to, to you have out. to pay for the coroner's yeah. inquest. You have to pay for everything, everything. If that person's a vagrant, yeah. If that person's homeless and just broke into your house for food, and you shoot them dead, the only person that any money can be recouped from is you. Yeah, it's actually cheaper to look after the very poorest segment of society, even on a personal level. Yeah. The amount of the amount you pay in taxes as a pittance compared to what you would pay hmm. if you didn't have taxes. So I think because... every, everybody's capable of being a realist that in the current capitalist system there are going to be winners and losers. And the people on the very nth of the scale of losers, possibly not even down to their own fault. It's said that uh, uh, something like a fifth of all homeless people are ex-servicemen mm -hmm. yep. or service women. Yeah, People with post-traumatic stress disorder. And to put it in perspective, there isn't much of a, of a mental health service left in the UK under the NHS No, not since anymore. Thatcher did her care in the community thing yep. and then underfunded that due to austerity mm -hmm. so we don't have a mental a, a mental health component really of the NHS no. so a lot of those people who are wandering about without any money are mentally ill mm -hmm. and they cost an amazing amount in police time ambulance crew time, hospital time emergency services in general including fire brigade and all that sort of thing as they light fires in deserted buildings in order to keep warm and two years ago that exactly that happened and a building got burned down mm -hmm. 15 people died or something purely because their only option for surviving the winter was to, to light a fire inside a building yeah so you know sprinkle a little bit of your capitalism with realism you know if you're going to be a capitalist or a libertarian and say this costs me money, it's not fair. I'm all right, Jack. Yeah. I've got my I'm all right, Jack. Yeah. Have a f think about other people for once. And some of that comes as a kickstart response as I can't care about everything. And it would just be, you know, if you knew that the minimum you could expect is, you know, housing, heat, you know, um, some form of money or food, and access to healthcare and access to education, maybe even access to retraining. Mm -hmm. You catch nearly all of the people that would fall through the cracks. Yeah. You know, things could be way better. I mean, those are discussions for another time. I mean, we're, we're supposed to be talking about Brexit. So, yeah, we've got in, we're in a situation now where Theresa May has been terrible, done potentially nothing. Yeah, but I mean, if you consider what she had to work with, um, for instance, there is, if, if we leave the EU with no deal, Inside the UK, I don't know if, if you're from another country, this may not make a lot of sense if you're listening to, if you're, I think everybody that normally listens to our stuff is aware of it, but there is a border between Southern Ireland or ERA and Northern Ireland. Yep. Northern Ireland is part of the UK, ERA or Ireland, as it's sometimes known, isn't. Mm -hmm. So if there isn't a hard border, if we crash out between Northern and Southern Ireland, just, I'm only calling it Southern Ireland for clarity. Clarity, yeah then British companies will just ship stuff through Ireland and mm -hmm. out to the EU and pay no tariffs. Yeah. Literally drive it over to Northern Ireland. It won't go through any hard border. Da, 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 da. It'll reach the Irish depot of that major company. It'll, they'll then be Irish goods that will then go to the EU. Yeah. We'll just simply circumvent it without contributing everything, anything. Yeah. So trade will go on exactly as it has done before, just with a, an extra couple of hundred miles of shipping. But so that, that can't happen. But it can't are... happen because tariffs need to be paid because we're no longer part of the EU. Yeah. We also can't put in a hard border because it's against the Good, Good Friday, Friday Agreement, Agreement, which was put in place to prevent what I'm going to start calling the Irish Civil War. Mm. <coughs> or is known, if you look it up in history books, as the Troubles, yeah. where thousands of people died because you've got Protestant and Catholic 
people in Ireland. It's uh, mostly Catholic in the south of Ireland and mostly Protestant in the north. And in both sections, the Pro Protestants abuse the Catholics in the north and these Catholics abuse the Protestants in the south. And that's been going on for as long as there's been Protestantism, probably about 500 years. And unfortunately, in a, in a move of utter stupidity, we decided to invade Ireland at precisely the time they were doing it, Mo uh, motivated the Irish Protestants against the Irish Catholics, managed to finally fight them to a standstill during after the English Civil War in 1640s, and drew a line across the top bit of, North, of Ireland because we wanted it for strategic reasons. Uh, and that's where all the money was, you know, places like Belfast and, you know... Mm -hmm and Londonderry and you know where the industry in Ireland was and took it over and now we can't hand it back because there will just be all out civil war and both sides have basically said there will be all out civil war yeah. the Catholics have said it and the Protestants have said it if we leave them to their own devices loads of people are going to die so now we're stuck there in a peacekeeping role that we really don't want yeah we must not forget so the... we can't put in a hard border because it will become a target for both Protestants and Catholics. We must not forget every so... building you build across there, every chain link fence, every wall, every little post across a road is going to get attacked. We must not forget that um, during the Irish Civil War, <laughs> right? that's what we As should you call, call it, it, right? We did. Ha the Britain did have a very disproportionately heavy-handed oh they were to proper it. bastards and yeah. they have been proper bastards for 300 of the 400 years we have eased off yeah because we don't like shooting people dead but we keep putting soldiers in positions where they don't have a lot of choice you know as as they quote in v for vendetta what's going to happen now the same thing that always happens when people without guns come up against people with guns mm -hmm. so th that is so Theresa may could never have got a good deal it was not possible. You could have sent anybody. There's I, I, no one in, in the UK we could have sent to go, go make us a deal I, that doesn't fuck us. I disagree. We could have had a good... Well, it depends on what your, your, your opinion of a good deal is. Like, if you're in favour of a soft Brexit, we could have easily got a good deal. If you're in favour of, like, um, the things like the, which Switzerland has or which Norway has, where they're part of the... European economic area, but they're not part of the European yeah, so Union. Yes, if we hadn't spent forty years being dicks. Yeah, because that's what the sweet the the Norway option. Norway model, yeah, yeah. The Norway model was like kind of they're in the EU as far as trade. They're part of the EEC. Yeah, but they're not. They're still a sovereign state. But they had to give up a whole bunch of shit to get that. Yeah. So I think they do pay tariffs on some goods. Some stuff is punitive. If anybody's ever been to Scandinavia, food is quite expensive because there's not a lot of farming land in Scandinavia, mm -hmm. which is why we have Vi we had Vikings. Because only so many people can own so much land in order to grow food on it. So you've got this situation where um, food is expensive in Scandinavia. Everything else is largely cheap or socialised. Yeah. I've never seen a homeless person in Scandinavia because if you have a homeless person in Scandinavia, they die. You have one winter, it's minus 30, they it's fucking really die. Really you can't survive outside. The government provides cheap housing and reasonable benefits if you can't work, but we'll endeavour to find you a job if you can. Yeah. Um, they're a broadly socialist, although, which is weird because um, lots, of, lots of Scandinavia fought on the German side during the Second World War, yeah. including the Finns, some of the Norwegians, some of the Danish. You know, they were like the Vichy French, you know, some people agreed with the idea of fascism. So I think if you've had a, 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 a fascist government of some kind, you're more inclined to go, Hoop, that's what happens when right wing people get too much say. Yeah, we need to look after them. And basically your biggest danger, if you're a fascist and you're middle class or, or more wealthy than that, you're upper middle class or upper class. Your biggest threat is the proletariat. Yeah, because they outnumber you 99 to one in most cases. Yeah, that's your biggest threat. And fascism neutralizes the proletariat and recruits them. But when they become disillusioned with fascism, they turn radically socialist. Yeah. And in some countries, ask a Chinese person, uh, you know, they, they get pretty murdery yep. with wealthy people. That's one of the reasons we've called this the Guillotine Assurance Society. Yep. Because um, universal basic income or universal socialism, where there is a minimum you can expect as a citizen of your country. Um it has been referred to as guillotine insurance yeah as in if you don't want to be guillotined like during the french revolution you might want to look after the poor yeah because there's a bucket load of them because you're capitalists yeah. 
capitalism creates the poor. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, money, as as they say in in, in M. Banks's culture, money is a sign of poverty. Yeah. If you have money, then you have poverty. If you don't have money as a society, you, there's no such thing as poverty. And we, we might have to leave it thereabouts. We've got a, f- a couple of minutes for final comments. We've got a couple of minutes for final we comments. We failed to talk about Brexit. We intended to so talk about, about socialist, socialist history. I am going to talk about Brexit, a, a Brexit thing real quickly. Yeah. So it's important to remember that um, Nigel Farage, who, Ooh. who, right? <laughs> Boo, boo, hiss, boo. Ooh. Nigel Farage, who was very much saying, who was often saying, we'll take back the North Sea fisheries, right? Mm. The reason there are the limits in the North Sea on fishing is because they've been the, fished out. Because they've been fished out, yeah. And then we have the common fisheries practice. Mm. Because the North Sea is not just our sea, it's ours, it's Scandinavia. It's Northern Europe. Northern Europe, yeah. It's not just ours. It's it's wrong to call it just ours. Mm. So we entered into the common fisheries practice. Who signed off on the common fisheries practice? Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage, yes. So he was telling he was with one side telling people the common fisheries practice is bad, and with his other side signed it off like he didn't care. Yeah. It is definitely a case of follow the money. Yeah. You know, follow the money. And you know it's it wasn't even a thing until Nigel Farage started being really noisy about it and started with it really UKIP. yeah yeah it really wasn't yeah. a thing UKIP, until then uh, like basically a bunch of rich investors who wanted more loopholes and realised that in a very short time frame those loopholes would be closed and they were desperate to get out of the EU before 2020 mm-hmm. and they might not manage it no I mean as it stands now with mm. what's been agreed in the UK Parliament where a hard Brexit is has been deemed illegal. Uh, hard, yes, a hard Brexit, a no deal Brexit. A no deal Brexit is been. now illegal. So they can't just fuck off and screw everybody. Yep. They've now got to negotiate a, a deal for Brexit yep. or they've got to revoke Article 50. And every time that this. So now no deal's completely off the table as far as a, a negotiating t- tactic between politicians. They've got to negotiate a better deal than the one Theresa May did, mm-hmm. which. It has to be said, it was probably the best deal we could have negotiated given the the hard border in Ireland, given other things that we had to have in place. We, we like I, trade I, agreements and stuff like that we, for I still think absolutely essential We could things. have done better. The the, the problem with Theresa May's deal We could have done better if we'd started off wanting to do better from the very start yes, of negotiations. The problem with Theresa May's deal is that Theresa May's deal wants a hard Brexit. Mm. Theresa May's deal is is based on making a hard Brexit work. Mm. It's based on making a we are completely out of the EU work. Mm. In that case, if you're going with that base standard, the, the starting with a we are completely out of the EU, it's probably the best deal. I still think if you had a referendum today, we would revoke Article 50. I think so. But I think if she had started off, if she had gone, right, what is the general consensus of what most most people want what do remain wants what do leave one because as they, they remember is the the actual referendum was almost entirely split down the middle yeah it was like one percent and it's like two percent and to ignore half of the population is just as undemocratic as going along with just 52 percent of the population yeah, just as undemocratic 51.6 or something like that oh yeah i've always said it so so and i think if you were going to do a referendum today You'd have to say, right, it's got to be two thirds majority. We can't dick around with dividing the country so diametrically. And that's what divided the country the most was yeah. that. Was how close it was. Was how close it was. Yeah, I think if it had been. And a lot of those people were voting on, they thought that we would literally be £350 million a week better off, and all that money would go straight into the NHS. Which it would never would. And that it would stop um, immigration. Yeah, which it never now, would. Now, what they, what they didn't mention was they. You know, a lot of people felt that that was um, our quota of brown people from war zones would go down. And it won't because we're part of the UN and the WHO, Mm. which requires us to take in X number of refugees from nearby countries. Yeah. You know, that's in order to prevent wars and shit. So that was never going to go down. And the people from Eastern Europe basically come here on work visas. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not entitled to claim benefits. It's like the old adage, they've come here to take our jobs and our benefits. You can't do Which is it? 
you can take they're your jobs, taking your job or they're or taking, taking your benefits. benefits. And if they're on work visas, they can't take your benefits. And it basically plugged into there was a, an element of it plugged into people's basic racism. Yep. Poor people's racism, which is like I haven't got much, and some people's coming over to take even a tiny sliver of it. I'm angry about that when it's not the case. The second layer of it was a certain sense of empire, which we don't have. Yeah, we've had for a long time. The third one, which was the most alarming one, which is why a general election right now is a bad idea, is because they wanted to show the government that they wanted to be heard. Yeah, which was the shittest reason. It was to destroy our economy. So, like, it's like the the reason we have, and this is why I'm going back to the thing about the newspapers. The reason we have this underlying racism of I have I am on very little, these people come here and get jobs and get paid, that's taken away from my pot. Or I know people who are worse off than me. Mm. Right? They're angry at people emigrating, but they're not angry they they should be angry at the fact that they're getting paid so poorly. Mm. They should have always been angry at Well it's the easiest the rich target. people. Yeah. That person stands out because they're brown or they have a funny accent or and, they're not and, from here. And the red top, and it's their fault. And the red top newspapers stoke that. Yeah. Oh, as does the Daily Mail, as does the Telegraph. Uh, the Guardian doesn't. Mm. But the Guardian's the probably Times. the only socialist. I mean, the one, th- the one newspaper which is very weird that seems to have like a regularly balanced viewpoint is the Financial Times of all things. Mm. The Mirror's okay. Yeah, but I mean, it's still a red top. It's still easy, yeah. easy thinking newspapers. It's yes. not like th- these things are all nuanced. People would like things to be black and white, but they never have been. Yeah. If you want, if you want a black and right, white reason why the world is in so much shit, I'll give you a very easy black and white reason. Wealthy people are greedy bastards, yep. and will do anything to divide people and stop people organising and saying, "Oi, wait a minute, mush, yep. that's not yours." Yeah. So simple enough. That's that's it. What a reason! One single reason why. I mean, the, world the simplest isn't... thing is also the least ethical thing, <laughs> but they're not ethical with us. The simplest thing would be go cultural revolution on it and build intergalactic, fully automated space communism. Yeah. But you would have to execute every every person of that class. I mean, they did it in China, mm-hmm. but now you've got a nouveau middle class in China that are oppressing the working class in China, despite it being a, a communist country. Mm-hmm. Yeah nominally there isn't a single i think the closest country to being marxist ironically is germany the, the actual, germany is about well, as close to a marxist country as you can get cuba no because even cuba's cuba's like a dictatorship you know fidel castro is president for life that's well, not yes that's sorry. not that's not socialism no you're right they sorry. had health care but, but he, everything else i mean he worked millions of people to death there was a, a food, I'll have to read upon that. There was a food and uh, food and manufacturing crisis in Cuba. I'll have to read upon that because I haven't I haven't seen that. They weren't able to sell tobacco in the form of cigars to America, which was yeah. their nearest customer. Um, so they tried to revolutionise the farming process and they set impossible quotas. Ah, uh, but uh, who's who's the in that instance then? Who's the actual thing in that? Is it Castro? Yeah. Or is it capitalism? No, it was Castro. I would. You, you want to read Cuban history a little bit more. I think I do want to read They've got a lot of good things. They've got nationalised healthcare, nationalised mm. education and stuff like that. They're some of the best looked after, best educated people in the world. But they're still dirt poor because of shitty decisions. And a lot of them died. There's a reason Cubans invaded Cuba. That's what the Bay of Pigs was. <laughs> yeah. No American serviceman set foot on Cuba. Cubans did. And because the Americans fucked up, you know, Cubans got killed. Very few Americans. I am going to still stand that capitalism has killed a lot more people. I think, um, what do you call it? Uh, what's the Stalinism? The Stalinism of Stalin. No, even, and the Stalinism even, of Stal- Mao. even Stalinism, capitalism has killed more than Stalin. Oh, you got to set a precedent on when the time frame is in the last five hundred years. In f- so so for in it, I think people no. calling themselves communists have probably killed more people. No, no, than no. Capitalism. Literally, they haven't. I will send you a link to a video by Bad Mouse Productions later. Okay, and you can watch it. He goes into the maths of the actual death rates by that were under the Soviet Union, right, under Stalinism, and into the death rates of capitalism in the same time frame. Yeah, and it's 
something like 20 times more people die under capitalism than under Stalinism. I think the uh, Stalinism, the, you know, I'm not, people like I'm now not and Sta- Stalin I am and not stuff Stalin. come a good, good second. I am not standing Stalinism. Stalinism mm. was terrible. Maoism is almost as bad because they have the dictator yeah, for life. As far as I'm, I'm aware, of people like Bakunin and the guy that wrote The Conquest of Bread and Marx, mm. those are all good ideas. Yes. The problem comes is when you let people run with the good ideas. The, the thing is, this, sorry, this is why Tolstoy got... Um, this is the sort of thing I'm hoping no, a Trotsky. friendly AI sorts out. This is why Trotsky had got to... Got murdered, basically. Got murdered, yeah. yeah had to, had to, to run... carry on in the frame of Lenin. When Lenin died, Trotsky was the number two. Yeah. Trotsky was going, OK, so we've got to di- divest power because the Soviet Union's too bastard big. Yeah. So we need now committees across the, what has become... Russia. Trotsky tried to actually do communism properly. Yeah. And Stalinism, and Stalin wasn't having any of it. Stalin wanted total power. Yeah, this so, is why when people say communism and then they point to the Soviet Union, I'm like, no, it's, leading to his famous ice pick massage. That is, yeah, it's like, yeah, an exactly. ice pick of all things. That is that's a pretty bourgeois thing to have, isn't it? An <laughs> ice pick, ice in your vodka. In Russia, to get ice in vodka, leave outside ten minutes in winter and get strong vodka and sheen of ice. Anyway, I think that's where we've got I think it there. We're, we're done, yeah. Well, we're just over an hour. So that's the uh, that's the first podcast of the Guillotine Assurance Society. Yeah. Uh, future ones might be longer. Future ones are also probably going to get recorded over Discord rather than... In- we're in person today. Yeah, that's we just happen to be in the same room. We're happen to be in the same room today. Future ones are probably going to end up being done over Discord. Uh, it might be longer, but I think an hour is probably about as long as you want. Yeah. But I'll... Send you the link to the Bad Mouse Productions video. Okay, so I'll put that. And if you put that in, in the this, description, in the description. Yeah. So people and also the, further reading, I'll put in the Mark Steel, Karl Marx, yeah. and Thomas Paine. Yes. Uh, lectures. They're twenty minutes long, but they're yeah. absolutely hilarious and brilliant to watch. If you add, if you you could probably card them, but yeah, no, we'll just put them in the description. That'd be cool. Mm. Right. So uh, I guess yeah. it's goodbye from me, Rembe. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs> hey. Then. <laughs> it's goodbye from them we've uh, updated the two Ronnies uh, and all the musicals seven persons forever seven other persons this is the guilty insurance society <laughs> you're trying to get we need we need the back there's got to be a. I must be able to clutch that together yeah this is the guillotine insurance, insurance society, society. The guillotine insurance society see so you get so we get someone to like write all the lyrics and stuff yeah Write the theme tune. And that's what comments are for. Comment, like, subscribe, do all that YouTube random fuckery. And, and don't uh, forget to click that bell so you get, <laughs> bell. Get, remember, you get notified of all the updates. Click the Liberty Bell in top le- top <laughs> bottom right hand corner, brothers and sisters and others. <laughs> anyway, that's it from us. That's it from us.